Okay, imagine this. You're looking up at the sky over Argentina. It's September 13th, 2025. Maybe late afternoon, maybe twilight is just setting in. Right. And then, whoosh, the whole sky just seems to ignite. Thousands of people all across the country, they see this thing. Oh. Phones going crazy, I bet. And what they're seeing is this incredibly bright green fireball yeah. just streaking across the sky super fast. Yeah. But it wasn't just something to see. Lots of people heard it, too. Like an explosion, sort of unnerving. It really stuck with people. Absolutely. A memorable event, for sure. So today we're doing a deep dive into this specific event, this uh, this fireball. It's technically a very bright meteor, right? Yeah, that's the term. We want to get beyond just the spectacle. You know? mm. Understand the science, why it happened, and maybe some surprising connections it has back here on Earth. And that's exactly our mission for you today. We're aiming to uh, pull back the curtain a bit on these cosmic visitors. They're dazzling, yeah, but often really fleeting. Gone in a flash. Exactly. We'll dig into the physics, you know, how something so dramatic can light up the sky and then just vanish without a trace, seemingly. Mm. And we'll connect that flash, that moment, to the bigger picture. Ongoing science, research, even Earth's own geology. These moments, they're packed with data, really. Lots of meaning for understanding our solar system's past. Okay, let's really paint that picture then, this bright green fireball. You mentioned the date, September 13th, 2025, over Argentina. Our sources stress this wasn't like one or two people. No, not all. Thousands of eyewitnesses. Local media jumped on it, covered a huge area. I mean, can you imagine the buzz, the confusion, just that collective gasp? Must have been quite something. But the sound thing really gets me. Not just seeing it, but hearing it. Widespread reports of an explosion-like sound. That makes it seem so physical. It does. It adds another layer. So where does that lead? You have this huge visual, this sound. Yeah. What happened next? Where did the thing actually go? Ugh, and that's the crux of it, isn't it? It's a fantastic example of atmospheric physics in action. Because despite the light show, despite those loud sound that people reported, yeah. the key detail is this. Our sources confirm no meteorite fragments or damage have been found. None. N nothing. After all that. Nothing. And that's not a minor point. It tells us basically everything we need to know. It strongly suggests the meteor, or technically the meteoroid, before it hit the atmosphere. Right. It disintegrated completely, just broke apart and burned up way up high. Wow. So all show, no punchline on the ground. Pretty much. And while it might sound a bit anticlimactic, you know, after such drama, this complete disintegration, it's actually really common for fireballs like this. The atmosphere does its job. So hold on. It puts on this incredible show, makes a huge noise, and then just poof, gone. No bits left. How does that work? How can our atmosphere just erase something that seems so powerful? Well, erase is a good word for it. Our atmosphere is an incredibly effective shield. Think about what's happening. An object comes in from space, could be several meters across, maybe bigger. Okay. And it's hitting the top of the atmosphere at insane speeds. We're talking tens of thousands of miles per hour, maybe 50,000, 70,000 miles per hour. Unbelievable speed. It's phenomenal. And it's not just friction, like rubbing your hands together. The air in front of it can't get out of the way fast enough. It compresses violently. Mm -hmm. This creates what scientists call ram pressure. It's like hitting a solid wall, but the wall is made of super compressed air. This puts enormous stress on the object. Okay, pressure, got it. And at the same time, that compression heats the air to thousands of degrees, white hot. So you've got this immense pressure and this intense heat hitting the meteoroid simultaneously. Right, double whammy. Exactly. It's called thermal shock combined with that dynamic pressure. Yeah. The meteoroid, especially if it's stony or icy rather than solid iron, just can't take it. It fragments violently. So it breaks apart before it burns up. Often, yes. It shatters into smaller pieces. And then those smaller pieces with much more surface area exposed, ablate, that's the scientific term for basically vaporizing or burning away really, really fast, almost instantly. Okay. Ablation. So that explosion sound. Yeah. It wasn't hitting the ground. Probably not, no. More likely it was a sonic boom from the object traveling faster than sound, or maybe shock waves from that fragmentation process happening high up. The air itself gets superheated and expands rapidly. That creates sound waves. So the sound came from the sky, not the impact. That's the most likely explanation given no fragments were found. It's really a testament to our atmosphere acting like a, well, 
a cosmic incinerator for most of the stuff that comes our way. That's fascinating. The difference between friction and this intense ram pressure and fragmentation. So, okay, if it completely disappeared, does that mean this specific event, the Argentine fireball, is just a cool story? Or can we actually learn something from it, even without pieces to study? Oh, absolutely. That's a great question. Even without recovered meteorites, these events are gold mines for data. We have ways. Like what? Well, think about sound. There are networks of infrasound detectors around the world. They listen for very low frequency sounds that travel huge distances, sounds we can't hear. Atmospheric explosions like this create infrasound waves. Ah, uh, so we can hear it even if we can't hear it. Precisely. Seismographs, meant for earthquakes, can sometimes pick up the ground vibrations from the airburst's shockwave. And then there are satellites. Watching from above. Exactly. Satellites looking for atmospheric flashes, maybe for military reasons originally, or for weather patterns. They can capture the light curve, how the brightness changed over time, and help calculate the trajectory. Okay, so you piece together all these signals. Right. The light, the sound, the trajectory, even the color. You mentioned it was green. That often suggests elements like magnesium or maybe nickel vaporizing in the intense heat. Putting all that data together. Let's you figure out what it was like. You can estimate its original size, roughly its composition, its entry angle, its speed, the energy it released when it broke up. So yeah, no physical trace on the ground, but it leaves a definite data trail. And that data helps us understand the whole population of meteoroids hitting Earth. Got it. So it's not loss, just mm -hmm. transformed into data. <laughs> okay, let's broaden this out then. This specific fireball, this dazzling show over Argentina, it wasn't just a random one-off event, was it? Our sources seem to link it to a bigger picture of scientific interest in meteorites, specifically in Argentina. That's a really important connection to make. This one event, even though it left no fragments, fits perfectly into this larger context of ongoing studies in meteorite research. It's part of this global quest to understand where we came from, the solar system's history. And Argentina plays a special role in that quest. A very special role. To really get the significance, we need to talk about Argentina's Chaco province. It's uh, kind of famous in meteorite circles. The Phil province. Okay. Yeah. Why? Well, history. Geology. It's a known hotspot for finding meteorites. So much so, actually, that they have specific security measures in place there. Security measures? For what? To combat meteorite smuggling. Wait, seriously, meteorite smuggling, that sounds mm -hmm. dramatic, like something out of an adventure movie. It sounds, it, yeah, but it's a real issue. So why? Why is Chaco province so important that people are trying to smuggle rocks out and scientists are studying it intensely in their security? What makes it such a focal point? It really underscores the region's significance, doesn't it? Chaco yeah. province, especially an area within it called Campo del Cielo. Campo del Cielo, yeah. field of the sky. Exactly, fitting name, right. It's one of the world's major meteorite strewn fields. An enormous shower of iron meteorites fell there thousands of years ago. We're talking maybe four or 5,000 years back. Wow. An ancient event. A very ancient event. Mm -hmm. And the geology there, the conditions, mm -hmm. sort of flat, ancient sedimentary basins, not too much erosion. It was perfect for preserving these things. Ah, so they didn't just land there. They stuck around because the conditions were right. Precisely. These are mostly iron meteorites. They're much tougher, denser, more resistant to breaking up in the atmosphere than stony ones, like the one that likely caused the 2025 fireball. Okay, so iron ones are more likely to survive the trip down. Generally, yes, especially larger ones. Yeah. And these irons that landed in Campo del Cielo were preserved remarkably well for millennia, just sitting there, sometimes buried shallowly, waiting. And that's what makes them valuable, the iron. It's what makes them scientifically valuable, immensely so. I mean, there is definitely a black market value, which drives the smuggling, unfortunately. But... For science, yeah. these are like time capsules, direct samples of the core of some ancient asteroid or maybe a planetesimal from the very beginning of the solar system. Over 4.5 billion years old, uh, unchanged. 4.5 billion, wow. Older than the Earth itself, practically. <laughs> well, formed around the same time as the Earth was forming. They tell us about the ingredients, the processes, how planets were built, what the early solar system was made of, Sometimes they even contain unique minerals or clues about organic compounds. Incredible. And Campo del Cielo has a lot of them. A huge amount. It's home to some truly massive specimens. There's one called El Chaco, which weighs over 37 tons. Think about that. 37 tons of space iron. That's hard to even picture. Is that the biggest? It's the second largest single meteorite ever found anywhere on Earth. 
So yeah, this place is a global treasure for planetary science. Researchers come from all over the world. Okay, with that kind of scientific gold mine, I totally get the smuggling concern. Now, how does that actually affect the research? And what do these security measures look like on the ground? Well, the smuggling is a serious threat. When someone just digs up a meteorite and sells it without recording exactly where it was found, how deep it was, what the surrounding soil or rock was like. You lose the context. You lose almost all the scientific value. It's like finding an ancient pot shard but having no idea which archaeological layer it came from. The object itself is interesting, but its story is gone. Right. It becomes just a rock, not a data point. Exactly. So the local authorities, the Argentine government, they recognize this. They've declared meteor rights part of the national heritage. There are laws against exporting them without permits. And the security. It can range from uh, increased vigilance, maybe patrols in the known areas, to educating local communities about why these finds are important, encouraging them to report finds to scientists, not sell them on the black market. It's about protecting this heritage for study. Makes sense. Protecting the story of the solar system, basically. That's a good way to put it. So let's bring this back to you, our listener. We started with this amazing sight, right? A bright green flash over Argentina sounds like an explosion. And we've ended up talking about atmospheric physics, how our planet protects itself, and then deep dives into geology, ancient meteorite fields, and even space rock security in Chaco province. It's quite the journey from that initial flash. It really is. And it highlights, I think, a really central question. What can we actually learn from something like that Argentine fireball, the one that vanished, the one that didn't leave any pieces behind? Yeah. What's the takeaway from a ghost meteor? Well, it's multi-layered. First, it's a powerful reminder of just how effective our atmosphere is. It's just this incredible shield. Imagine Earth without it, we'd look like the moon, pockmarked with craters everywhere. Right. We owe the atmosphere a lot. We really do. It shows this constant dynamic dance between Earth and space, something that makes life possible here. We just don't think about it most days. True. It's easy to take for granted. But it's not just about protection, is it? You said there was data. Exactly. That's the second point. Even ghosts leave traces, in a way. The data collected light curves, infrasound trajectories, it all helps refine our models. How does the atmosphere work? How do different types of objects behave when they hit it? Which helps with? What? Predicting future impact. It feeds into that, yes. Understanding how asteroids break up is crucial for planetary defense. If we ever need to nudge something dangerous out of the way, we need to know how it might react. So even disintegrated meteors provide vital clues. Okay. Defense applications. Makes sense. And thirdly, maybe the most profound connection, these disappearing fireballs remind us why the ones that do make it through, like the irons and Chaco, are so precious. Oh, uh, the contrast. Precisely. The atmosphere filters out so much. What gets through is special. Those survivors, those chunks of iron from Campo de Cielo, they are literally pieces of other worlds delivered to our doorstep. They hold secrets about the birth of planets, maybe even the origins of life's building blocks. So the fireball that vanished highlights the value of the ones that didn't. That's the aha moment, I think. It connects the fleeting beauty of that green flash to the hard, tangible science we can do with a rock that traveled billions of miles and millions of years to reach us. Wow, what an amazing connection. This deep dive really covered some ground, from that bright green streak over Argentina that just vanished, to the science of how our atmosphere smashes space invaders, and then this whole unexpected story about Chaco province and its role in meteorite research. It really ties the sky to the ground, doesn't it? It absolutely does. It shows how everything's connected in this dynamic cosmos we live in. A constant interplay. Exactly. And maybe that's the thought to leave everyone with. Next time you're looking up at the night sky, just take a moment. Consider all the invisible action happening way up there. This constant ballet of dust, rocks, maybe even bigger things interacting with our atmosphere. Mm. Think about the brilliant fireballs that streak and vanish unseen over oceans or remote areas. What other hidden celestial dramas are playing out right now that we'll never even know about, but that are part of this grand cosmic story? 